Yeah, thank you. Good morning and welcome to my talk, streaming Why Should I Care? My name is Christian Drebing. I'm working at uh, Blue Yonder, a German company doing um, retail solutions, uh, predicting what they need, what they should order. Yeah, so that's the background of me. And now let's start with the talk. What will expect you in, the, in this task? In this task? At first, I will give you a motivation on why it makes sense to look at streaming at all. And yeah, that's also the title of my talk. And I will give you some background why I came to that question at all. I want to give some introduction into what is streaming, what is the basics of that, and then show you how you can use this within Python. Finally, showing some challenges that might await you when you go uh, down this road or maybe swim down that stream so that you are prepared to tackle them. OK, let's have a look at the situation um, we faced as a team for quite some time. We have a data processing application. As I already said, we are doing uh, machine learning. We get lots of data from our customers. And uh, we had a quite monolithic application. So uh, what we have is we get input data from the customer. They send it in large XML files. Uh, we need to validate that data. We need to make sure that this is fine, that this is, has the right quality to go into the machine learning. We do the machine learning that takes lots of input data, writes, writes out lots of output data, and then we have this output interface where the customer can query the data, um, uh, the results of our machine learning. So this works quite fine. I mean, the results are, quite, uh, are really good. But uh, we, have some, uh, we have some issues with operations and with extending with that. So yeah, we have this big database uh, in between where we store all that data, where all these uh, boxes are accessing that. We're using uh, SQL Alchemy to access it from Python. We're using uh, Alembic for database upgrades. And all this works fine. But if you have uh, also an application of that type, you might know some of the pains that come with that. So for example, um, we have several teams developing this application. And now there are dependencies. We all depend on this one database. And the customer desperately wants a new feature in machine learning. Also, the machine learning team says, oh, that's great. It's no big deal. We just have to change our query a little bit. We have to write one more field to the output tables. And then that's fine. Then well, that's no big deal. But the other team is also working on that. And it's also working on the database. And they are doing some refactoring on them. They are changing their data validation. Uh, all is very good that they do that. But this conflicts. And they say, well, yeah, it just takes two weeks uh, time. Just uh, then we're finished. And we need to see that we have no conflicts in that. So really, yeah. now you as a machine learning team you say, well, no, we have to wait. That's bad. But that's nothing we can do about. This is one thing, one challenge that you might face. Other things are uh, for testing. So uh, it's always hard if you have one big application to establish clear boundaries, to have a, a solid uh, testing strategy there. You try really hard. But uh, well, this is at least not an architecture that supports you in that. Yeah, I also yeah, like the testing in layers talk from Monday, and where you see all these nice little boxes and how you, can, how you can separate that into layers. And for sure, you can do that with such a monolithic application, but it's just hard to do so. Then I went to EuroPython already two years ago. In 2015, I heard many talks about microservices, and I really liked that. It was a great idea. It solves these issues that, uh, uh, that you split up the monolithic application into several boxes, and you can handle that boxes separately. Each has its own data. Each has its own upgrades. The teams can develop independently. Wow, that's great. And we had lots of discussions afterwards, uh, after these talks, on how we can use that for us. But well, as I said, we have a data processing application. And for data processing, we have to process lots of data. And uh, that's where we uh, saw that we cannot use this model in this purest function. As 
we would have to, to transfer lots of data between the services. We have to save lots of data in each of the services as each service needs many of that data. So unfortunately, as nice as it looked, as it looked but that was nothing for us. Yeah, there we stood. Microservices sound great, but I mean, we had lots of case studies. They were used in billing. They were used for more transactional applications, and this worked fine. But as I said, we could not use that. And then at other conferences, so many people were talking about streaming. And also uh, here at, uh, at this Europython, I already heard many talks. And uh, it's great. It's great to see. But most applications use that in financial services uh, for stock markets where they have lots of data volume, where they have to process that really fast, or they are using it for online advertising where they have to process click streams or logs and doing that really fast. And uh, well, I thought these are the traditional domains of stream processing, and we are not in there also. So what possibilities do we have? We're just standing in the midst. Well, we can't do microservices, uh, and streaming seems to be uh, the domain of other people. It sounds interesting, but yeah, maybe nothing for us. Fortunately, during a different project, uh, I came into contact and do, uh, did some evaluations for streaming there, and suddenly uh, it came to my mind that, uh, that this might be fine for us. Also, we don't have millisecond aware click streams to process many things that well, might be more side effects of streaming and not just uh, this, this pure millisecond processing are really, really good, and we can use that to solve the issues we have. And that's the reason for me for giving this talk. Maybe if you are in a similar situation, I hope that this will help you also and give you some ideas on how you can improve your application. So let's do introduction to streaming and give you some basic idea of what this is. My background, as I said, is coming from a database-centric application, and therefore I want to compare this and give you some idea where are the differences. So let's look at databases and streams. I heard a talk from Martin Kleppmann, which he gave at the Strange Loop conference in 2014, turning the database inside out, and I thought this was a very good way of thinking about databases and streams. Because essentially, in a database and in a stream, you have the same information. When you have a database, then this database has internally a change log. And this change log tells what did change within the data, your database tables. And from this change log, this is essentially a stream. And you can reconstruct the database content at every point in time. So when you, when you look at it here, in the first entry, it says, well, change a row with a key A to the value 1. And then you see this table has one row with key A and value 1. Then as next, uh, another information comes in change row B to the value 5, and you see it in the table. Then comes change row C to the value of 3, and you see that in the table. And then it gets more interesting. You have updates for existing tables. So A gets the value of 8 then A gets the value of 4, and C gets the value of 2. And each, at each point in time, you have a consistent uh, table in your database. So that's the basic idea of, well, uh, the, uh, the similarity between tables and streams. And databases use that internally for replicating to different nodes, for example. But why does this matter for us? The most interesting thing from uh, in my situation was that different services we have can be in different states. So we don't have this dependency to one single state because each stream processor, each service, can have a different offset within that stream. Let's take this example here. We have the service 1, which now is on index, uh, on offset 3, and he sees the table as A has, is 8, B is 5, and C is 3. We have a different service that is already at the offset of 5, and there A is 4, B is 5, and C is 2. And this is totally fine. Both services are in a consistent state. And if service 1 uh, catches up to the offset of 5, then you will have the same information as service 2. So the interesting thing is you can have several services that can operate at different speeds. 
and this is one thing we have uh, for our application. At one point in time, we might get lots of new data from the customer. We might write lots of data into that stream, and we have services that process that faster. We have services that process that slower. But as long as they are able to catch up, that's totally fine. And yeah, you can add new services to that structure, which can process the stream from the beginning on. And you, can, you have just more control. You have more possibilities uh, how to scale your services. So you don't have uh, that all services need to be at the same speed, but you can uh, design by your needs. Do I have services that need to get faster? Do I have uh, services where it's fine that they are slower? For example, just uh, aggregating some reporting mechanisms, whereas on the other hand, you want to answer the customer fast. OK, so we have that possibility. That's great. But how can we use it? I mean, I said some services might be faster, some services might be slower. How can we influence the speed of our services? Well, we can program better. That's fine. So we can, we can uh, just improve our code. But this has just a, a limited effect. Sometimes we need to have even more. And there comes one idea into play that's uh, also very helpful in streaming. You can partition your streams. This means, uh, and, and that's always uh, a decision based on your, uh, your business domain, on what partitioning makes sense. For us, for example, we get sales streams. We get the information about uh, in what location did we have which sale. And we can use this for partitioning our stream. So let's say we have here our sales stream. We have three locations. We have uh, Rimini, where we are now. We have Bilbao, the last year of Python conference. And we have Karlsruhe, uh, where our company is based. So we sell spaghetti, we sell ravioli, we sell pizza, and we have this on different times and in different quantities. And now we can have one processor that works on all these three partitions. That's fine, and that's maybe the best uh, place to start. But as we see we need to get faster, we have the possibility to split this up, to introduce one or two new processors, and they can work in parallel on these different stream partitions. So each partition could be handled by a different processor. And this eight stream example will follow us throughout the rest of this presentation. How does it look like? So we don't have the database-centric, we don't have the microservices, but we have here the streaming platform now in the midst, and the idea is that we can be at different offsets in that. So uh, what did we gain? We have clearer boundaries for our services. We have all these ideas that we can deploy them independently, uh, independently, that we can operate them independently, and the data is mostly in the streaming platform. Well, you might ask yourself, why do we have this data bubbles still in the processors? I'll answer that later. And what is about these database schema changes uh, that I talked at the beginning, when the data validation team needs to update it, and also the, uh, the machine learning team needs to update that? Also this, save this question, it will be answered later. So what did we gain? As I said, independent development, upgrade, and we have more options for scalability. Did we throw out the databases completely? We have the streaming platform in between. Well, think of these data bubbles, and we'll come to that later. For me, one important question was, this all sounds so great, this is such a good idea, and it seems to solve so many problems. Sounds like magic. And magic, that's always something that makes me suspicious. Maybe there's something I don't see. Maybe uh, there are new problems uh, that arise, which I just don't know of at the moment. And uh, yeah, it is not magic. It is a trade-off. I mean, a database is very powerful. You have many guarantees that are given you by the database. You have the the asset consistency guarantees, uh, guarantees in your transactions. You have the SQL language, which is a so powerful way to retrieve the data that is there in the database. You can do nearly everything. But as we have seen, this comes at a price. We are depending on one single state. And also, the scaling is hard. Also, scaling of the database is hard. So we have to think, do we need all these things that the database gives us in our application? And what are things that we lose? So with streaming, we don't have the asset guarantees anymore. We have an ordering on a stream partition. 
so what the streaming platform will give us, it will guarantee us when we feed entries into the stream, each service that will retrieve these entries will retrieve them in the same order. This might be a small thing compared to the asset guarantees, but it's fascinating what you can construct from that. And when you have several things on several streams, just given this ordering constraint, you are able to construct many of the guarantees that you need. And we don't have the SQL queries anymore. So it is not possible to query a stream. And this is something that you really have to get in your head when you are thinking about that. You might be used to SQL, you might be used that you can query for any uh, row with any value or doing a join on that, but this is not possible. The stream just goes through your processor and it's your possibility to keep that state and to remember what was the last value of A. And you have to decide whether you can live with that or not and what, uh, what mechanisms you employ to help with that. I mean, you see what you lose, but at least I feel better now. I know it's not a magic that might come back to me in the worst moment at all, but it's a, it's a conscious decision that you can do, and you can see the trade-off on whether that's good or bad for you. Okay, so much to the theory. Now, we are using Python at our company. We really love to use Python in real, most uh, of our services. And uh, how can we do that in Python? Just taking a step back, Apache Kafka is a streaming platform. This is not Python. This is implemented in Java. But we'll come back to Python soon. This is, uh, um, this is, what we on, what, uh, this is an example of the streaming platform. So you can have here producers that put data into the streaming platform. You can have consumers that retrieve data from the streaming platform. And you have the stream processors that well, they take that data and they uh, uh, wrangle that data and they, might, uh, they put it back to different streams then. And you can also have some connections to, the, uh, to databases to get that data from there directly. So that's a really cool streaming platform. It's used by many people, it's very scalable and it's really battle-proof, so that's a thing that you can build on. And there are also Kafka clients in Python. We also, uh, I heard just uh, yesterday, also from others uh, that, we, that are using them. And uh, you have PyKafka, Python Kafka, and the Confluent Kafka client, which are the three I have seen. And also other people already have done very nice uh, comparisons uh, on that. For example, here the Activision Games. You can have a look there in detail if you want. The interesting, uh, the, um, uh, the interesting differences between them are PyKafka and Python Kafka. Kafka are both depending, uh, written completely in Python. PyKafka has a very Pythonic interface, whereas Python Kafka more simulates the C interface. And we have the Confluent Kafka client. This is not pure Python, but this is using the C library librg Kafka, but it's the most performant of these. So we decide to use the Confluent Kafka client. There's many configuration options, and it's really uh, worth looking at them because uh, this might, uh, you can use them for performance tuning. So at first, I was a little bit surprised when I used the client, and it seemed also slow, but uh, it was just to my testing setup where I had very little records, and the standard settings are not for these little records, but for more. It has more buffering in there, and if you re reduce that, you can come to very low latency also in your test setup, which then yeah, feels much better. So let's see how can we use these clients. First thing is to have a producer. I just have to give that producer the bootstrap server, which is uh, my uh, Kafka node, which is default on port 1992. I have some data. You can see here the state data and Rimini. On, uh, on Monday, we sold some ravioli, and we want to uh, input that to a stream called sales input, and we are using JSON to serialize that data. Then we want to consume that, and also the consumer, it needs to know the Kafka node to connect to. Well, it has some further settings, of which uh, here the topic config might be uh, most interesting uh, for you, because topic config tells you, do I just use the new values appearing on that stream, or do I want to process the stream from the beginning on? 
So default is that you just look at new values, but here, especially in testing, it's always very helpful to start at the beginning. We subscribe our consumer to the same topic, to sales input, and the most important things are here. We are polling the consumer, we are checking that this worked fine, that we have something in there, and then we just print the received message, and it will show up as the JSON string we put in there. That's great. This uh, already works as we need it to. Now we use JSON as a serialization format. That's also good for a starting point. But as you are working with many teams, uh, it's always good to have some defined schema. In your databases, the schema was defined by the database, and this is good so that everyone knows what is in there. And also, for your, uh, for your streaming applications, you can use more rigid schemas than just put on JSON. What we decided for is for Apache Avro, and uh, this is a schema where you define, uh, this is something where you define the schema at first. Um, you give some data types, you give some fields, so it has many, many possibilities to define that schema. And it's also a very good uh, compacted, so it's not just writing the JSON format, but it has a compaction in it, which is also very good if you want to save some space. But what excited me most about Apache Avro is it that it defines also schema evolution. This means you can enhance your schema. You can add new fields, and uh, it, uh, it defines the criteria on how you can enhance that schema. So, for example, for new fields, you always have to give a default value, because this ensures that also processors that are at an older state can use that data. And uh, if they want to retrieve data that was written by an older service, then the default value is applied. And if they are reading the data that was written by a newer version of the service, then it already has this field with, uh, uh, with what the service has put in there. So this is really great. And this solves one issue which I uh, promised to answer you 10 minutes ago. This is when different teams wanting to, ex uh, wanting to enhance the schema. So by that, they can use in a compatible way different versions of records in there. And you don't have to reprocess all entries in the, uh, in the stream as you would have done with a database upgrade script. So how does that look like in Python? We have here the schema defined. It has a name. It says it's a record of many fields. And I say, what, is the, uh, what are the types of that field? We have strings. We have quantities. There are many other types also. And as I said, you can, uh, you can say whether a field is optional. You can say whether a field has a default value or not. So we're using this. And now we can use a different producer and consumer. We use the Afro producer and the Afro consumer. And you can see here. Still, we have to give the Kafka now. Now we have to give the schema registry URL. So this is something where the schema is registered, where every service can retrieve all versions of that. And this schema registry, this also checks that you only do compatible schema upgrades, which is great, because as soon as you want to write a schema in a new version and it's not compatible, it uh, raises an exception and tells you, well, this is wrong. So you know it from an early point on. The other things are mainly the same. We are giving default schemas for a key and a value. We can use our data here, and we now don't encode it in JSON, but we give it directly to the Afro producer. He uses the Afro schema to encode that and writes it to the stream. Also for a consumer, the main new thing is that we have give that schema registry URL so that it does know how to interpret things that are on that stream. And we are using uh, here also polling, and we just can check on what is the value on here. So these are mainly the examples used from the Confluent uh, Kafka client, so you can also have a look there to dig in deeper and to have some more explanations on that. Okay, this, these are the basics how we can write and read from, uh, from a stream. What do we do with that? So let's have a look at data validation. As you remember, that's the second box we had in there. Uh, and what do we want to do there? We have to say it's input, and we need to check whether that's correct or not. So we're separating the valid and the invalid sales records in the same way as during uh, the Cinderella fairy tale. She has to separate the good piece and the bad piece, and this, these are what we want to do here within our service. 
So very basically, we just pull the new records. Let's say we have a function which checks whether the sales record is valid, whether the location is a valid one, uh, whether the quantity is non-negative, for example, all these things you can think of. And if it's valid, you write it to a new stream sales validated, and if not, you can write it to a new stream sales error, and then let the other processors handle this information. For example, how to answer the customer that he sent an invalid sales record. That's fine. A very interesting thing about streaming is that you can add additional processors in a very easy way. So let's say either we want some new stuff, uh, we, uh, we want to have uh, some moni monitoring, some reporting on that, and we write this monitoring or reporting to a new stream, or we have a new uh, validation logic, which we just want to try. We don't want to put it directly into production, but we want to uh, write its results out for a different uh, topic to check whether this worked fine. When we had the database-centric application, we would have to remember the processing state. So we have one state, and for every record in our sales table, we would have known is it validated or not, has it been processed or not. So a second service for validation would be really hard because it has to, uh, it has to know, well, it, this has been uh, validated by that service, but I have not validated, I need to introduce a new field or so. But this is not the case here. Each service can know how far it has processed so that it can work independently, which is a thing that might, might not sound that interesting, but as soon as you have tried it, it really uh, is uh, fun to work with that because it makes things really much easier, especially when you develop and you want to try out new things. So these are the basics for using the streaming. Now let's come to the challenges. I said we do machine learning, and machine learning, uh, especially in the training, is not a thing that you do in streaming, and the, the results, uh, the real machine learning answers, well, they might be different, but for us, as we do forecasts uh, for sales in a daily way, this is also something we do in batch. So how can we work with these batch-like processes within our streaming? our machine learning application needs to uh, get all data based for the training in one batch. Or maybe in several, they are working in a partitioned way, but still there's many data in that. So how do we get that input data? And remember, you, don't, you can't query that stream. You can't tell, give me for all keys the current value. So somewhere we need to save that data. We have several options. We can just keep it in the memory of our service. We can use a separate database, so a serving database that is, uh, doesn't need to be that powerful as the database from our monolith, but still we could use a smaller database. Or we could uh, use a blob store, which is uh, also just cheaper than a database, and we can save the values in there, and it can be used by, the, by our machine learning application. And yes, that is data duplication. It feels bad at the moment, especially if you come from a very normalized database scheme. But that's the price. We'll have to pay. We have several advantages, and we also then have to live with that data duplication. But what's the idea behind such a duplication? Um, how can you explain that? And what I found very helpful in there was to differentiate between a write path and a read path. So for reasoning about does it make sense or not, I think that's a very helpful distinction. And in our old way with the database, we had a relatively short write path. So we put the validated data in the database, and then the data validation is finished. And when we start our machine learning, we are doing a machine learning query that needs to fetch all, the, fetch all this data with a very big joint statement, and then feed it into the machine learning. So this is the read path. And this Machine learning query is something that really puts the database under much pressure, and you have to see your database sizing that it can work with such a big query in a relatively short time frame. Now let's compare this to how we would do it with streaming. You see the write path now is longer. Because we have the data validation, we write that to our topics, and as soon as we have new data on that uh, topic, we can, al we, we can already do the joining. So. We are joining the new sales data, with sales data with the location data, with the product information, and maybe further data, and write that to a blob store. 
And there it sits, and it waits until the machine learning is started. What we have lost is our normalized schema, because, uh, because now we have the data duplicated, but what we have gained is a very big operational advantage, because that write path can be more scaled. As soon as the data arrives, we can write it there, and it sits there until the machine learning starts. So when the machine learning starts, it doesn't have to do that big join that really puts the database under pressure, but it can use the data in a format that it needs and uh, that this is consumed by that. So we have duplication, but we have gained operational advantages. How would such a thing look like? So, as I said, we have this location data, we have the products data, and we have uh, the sales data. We can treat that locations and that products. It's master data that's not such a high data volume. We can keep that in the, in the service as a table, and we join that additional information to the sales stream. And then that joint data we can append to a file, and this file then sits there and waits until the machine learning is started. This is the possibility to cope with a challenge that the machine learning is still batch. You might have noticed when I explained that, that I said, well, the sales and the, lo uh, the location and the product data, they are kept in the processor. So that's a state that we have in a processor. And state, as you might know, is the nightmare of every distributed systems engineer because it's hard to handle. What state? Do we need there? I mean, for streaming, the data could just rush through, but for example, in our, uh, in our uh, scenario, we need to know what is the master data so that we can join that information for that, so that's the data you want to join with. But there are also other things that might be more subtle, so when you have some time window processing, you want uh, to aggregate uh, a stream that comes in and you want to know the sum every five minutes, then you need to know the data of the last five minutes so that you can sum that up correctly. And you need to know when to start a new aggregation. And there are different ways of doing that. You can have hopping time windows or sliding time windows. So that's just uh, different possibilities that have different requirements to the state. Formally, the database did this for you. You could ask them. Uh, you could ask for master data. You could uh, ask for things in the last five minutes. Now you have to know that within your service. Well, it's fine, you might think. You just keep that in memory. You know what came in. Everything's fine. But there are some challenges. Well, a processor might fail. And then it needs to restart. And all state is lost that was in its memory. So from where does he get the data for restarting? Or something less dramatic, but as I said, one thing that we really want to use is scaling. So at first we had a processor that took care of all locations, and now we want for each processor to have one location. So this also changes the state in there. Or let's say we had three processors for each location, and now we want to merge that into one. So at least the location master data needs now also to be merged to this one processor. How can we do that? Well, as I said, we just keep in memory, and maybe we just keep all state in memory that we might possibly need in the future. That's one option, but it's not the best one. Uh, you can reprocess just a stream from the beginning on to warm that up. This might take a long time. Or each processor could keep its own database instance and save the state in there so that it uh, can be used at restart, and you just need to know to connect to which database, which yeah might also be interesting. You can save your condensed state in a stream, which is an interesting thing because you have that streaming platform already. Or you can just ask a different service that hopefully knows all the master data, and you can uh, tell them, please give me all things I need to know. Several frameworks already exist to cope with that problem, and it's very interesting if you start uh, with a, your very naive approach in using that, to have a look at such frameworks, uh, what they do and uh, why they might do it. And then uh, you, you can really learn from their experience, even if you are not in the same language. For example, you can have, you can have a look at Kafka Streams or at Apache Samsa. And uh, up to yesterday, uh, my impression was there is nothing we can use in Python. And, uh, well, we have to think, can we uh, employ some learnings from these other things? Do we have to write our own framework? Does it make sense or not? 
And uh, we really were searching for an answer then, and was very glad to be uh, in a talk uh, from uh, Winton yesterday, and they said they now open sourced yesterday the Winton Kafka streams, which is the Kafka streams doing in Python, and I'm really eager to have a more uh, look uh, to have a look at that. Uh, they also said it's at the beginning state and there are still some topics they need to solve, but it's very great to have a starting point in there and to check whether we can, whether you can contribute to that. And uh, uh, yeah, just grow this functionality in Python, which would be really great to build more applications on that. So you see here, it's the GitHub link, Winton code, Winton Kafka streams. Well, and that's the end of my talk. Let's summarize what have we learned in that. You have more options for your data processing application than you might have thought, but you also know the trade-offs. Trade and I want to encourage you just to broaden your way of thinking about your application to see there are more things that you could use and you need to check whether you can live with the trade-offs or not. And you know the challenges, you know some possible solutions. So yeah, now go on and build some great applications on that. That's it from my side. OK, well, uh, great. Thank you very much for the great talk. That's awesome. Uh, we have uh, almost 10 minutes for question. Great timing. Uh, any question? Any question for Christian on streaming? Otherwise, I do have a question. Well, I'll start with my question. Um, very interesting technology. Uh, I've never used streams. Uh, how do you deal, uh, or maybe the framework deals with missing value, say you have a network glitch somewhere, somebody trips on a network cable and you're missing, I don't know, two or three values in your stream, or do you care? Well, what the framework uh, guarantees to you is that within a stream partition, you get all the values. I mean, if it cannot guarantee it, you will get an error. So this is something you really can rely on. But what uh, you have to deal with is some streams might operate at different speeds than other ones. So for us, uh, one challenge will be, and this was just too complex to bring it uh, into that uh, short presentation, um, let's say the customer delivers you some location and some product master data, and he delivers you some sales data. And now um, the uh, location data is delayed. This, uh, the, there's some issue on the node uh, that processes that, and you are at a, uh, at a past offset, but you add a new offset for the sales data. And now you would raise an error because you say the sales record is invalid and you don't because that location doesn't exist. But this would be bad because the customer would tell you, well, I already sent you that. Why do you give me an error? And this is something where your application logic then has to cope with. And uh, we will do that uh, as we have uh, one input uh, the data input, it always will assign delivery IDs and processing timestamps when, when this was delivered. And now your validation logic needs to check that you, are, uh, that you have processed also the recent master data records. So this would be the solution to cope with that issue. But for the stream partitions, you always can rely that you will get all values in the correct order. OK, great. Um, thank you. Any other question? We do have. A few minutes, seven minutes, more or less. I can keep asking questions, folks. Uh, but uh, if you have yeah. any question, and a question over there. Sorry, I didn't see you. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the great talk. It's uh, really nice to see somebody else doing the same thing that we do as well in our company. I have a question about recovering uh, state in the case that your consumer crashes. Did you try some sort of seeking back in the stream to to find the latest uh, latest state that you could recover from? Um, well, that's the thing. Uh, you, it's not seeking back in the stream, but. Uh, um, 
you can always have a snapshot of your data so uh, that you know uh, that you have in in some data file, uh, you save uh, what, uh, what master data did I receive, for example, and this is used also when we do some, do some queries for that to do some data science in there. And with that stream, uh, within that storage, you also save on what was the offset in the stream, which corresponds to that. So by that, you always know from which point in time you have to reprocess your stream if you want to get the updates compared to such a blob storage. So this would be the way well, to, to search in the stream for updates that are missing. Thanks. I, I like this approach. Uh, if I can just quickly share what we did, uh, we implemented uh, time-based seek in, in the stream. So each one of our Avro messages, just like you, we use Avro, each of our Avro messages contains a timestamp. So we implemented a sort of binary uh, search in the, in the stream so we can return to a particular point in time. But it is, I mean, it works, but it's not very elegant. So I like your solution better. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard with time-based things, as we want to think about always in a distributed systems manner. And uh, then uh, you have different processors that might have slightly different time things. So what we want to do is we want to use that stream of the delivery IDs, which then is guaranteed to always be in the same order. And if you, if you reference these newly created uh, things, then you can ensure that you are really in the correct sequence. Cool. Very. Excellent. So any other question? I'm standing here so I can see you. OK. No other questions? Well, um, let me see. Oh, a question here. I have a beginner question. Uh, how do you integrate the data? It's all, it's all in. Uh, different databases, right? Or oh, excuse me, can you repeat the question? How do you integrate the data um, of those several databases? Um, you have uh, data paths, and they are uh, saving the data in several databases, right? Or, or not? Yeah, I mean, for each stream processors, you have uh, for each stream processor, you have different possibilities to save that in there, and uh, not everyone uses a database, and not everyone needs to be queried. So we want that, uh, that each service, they do not need to know about what technology the other services use. So, so the communication really is uh, with the streams, and how each uh, the databases are more that uh, each service can be restarted for that, or or that also other parts of application can say, well, I need to know uh, all locations that you have in there. But then he queries uh, that service for that. So it's, it's not a question of database integration. All this integration should work via the streaming platform, and they should not need to know about that. It's the only thing uh, where we need to know about it is, uh, well, as I said, uh, we want to do some exploratory data science on this, uh, which is not connected to the, to the streams, but directly uh, to, to the output data. But then the data scientist knows where the data lies in. But within that application, all communication should be via the streams. Mm -hmm. okay. OK, we have time for one more question. Oh, yeah. Come on. Okay, yeah. One question. Uh, do you have any particular strategy to handle the uh, migration updating of the data that it's already queued into the topics of your streaming infrastructure? If it change the format or anything like that due to code changes or things like that? Mm. Um, let me see whether I understood the question correctly. Um, I mean, if it's not just uh, the, the schema evolution we have, but if you say uh, that, we, uh, that we need additional, queer, additional fields in the query for our machine learning, is, is that a question, how to handle that? Yeah, the question is, I mean, I suppose there is a service that puts your 
the data into your streaming queue, okay? Mm -hmm. And the data it's probably formatted, marshaled in some way. If you change that format in any mm -hmm. way, I mean, do you? How do you tackle that? The yeah. For for that, you then really have to reprocess your data. So, so uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, if, if you have a, a different output format and this uh, does not uh, help you what you have uh, done in there, then you need to reprocess that data. Well, uh, actually, I was looking for the next speaker, sorry. <laughs> so we, have, uh, we are n have no more time for questions, sorry. Uh, I'm looking for the next speaker. Please identify yourself and come to the podium. And let's thank Christian again, the great talk, great questions. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you.